You are in the office of rants, which is where for $5, I will rant about a topic of your choice. Click the link in the description to request a rant. This one comes from Hot Pocket. Rants about why Shinji Mikami clears Hideki Kamiya. Differences in their design styles, influence, which is more quote unquote valuable or needed today. So this has been an ongoing meme in my friend group that oh, Mikami is actually the, the true goat and Kamiya is just a hack. And uh, <laughs> obviously Bayonetta is my favorite game of all time. A lot of you know this, but then I always say maybe number two or even tied is Resident Evil 4. Obviously they're both directors I I very much appreciate that I that I always have an eye on and that are linked in a very obvious way. Kamiya is a, a protege of Mikami's. He, Mikami was the one who kind of put him on, who gave him the, the chance at a director's seat. Now, there's a lot of history stuff I could go into. I think I will over the course of this video. I guess the easiest thing to talk to first would be the difference in their approach to structure with games. My impression of Mikami's games is that he tends to either follow the paradigm that is kind of trendy right now, again, structurally speaking, or he, he sets the standard. So in the case of Resident Evil, for example, original Resident Evil, I mean, you could even go further back, like Aladdin, obvious 2D stage-based platformer. That was the shit. That was the that was the first-person shooter of of the 90s. But then Resident Evil, the the sort of faux Metroidvania structure was kind of the shit. Self-contained location that you keep backtracking through, where you slowly progress by getting stronger. So he was following that trend, or I don't want to say following that trend. I mean, it was, it might not have been like a, a conscious effort to emulate other games. I'm just saying it fit the, the overall landscape. But then you get to Resident Evil 4, and I think Resident Evil 4 was when he, along, I want to say with a game like Half-Life 2, set a new paradigm of a sort of big budget linear action game where you progress through a sequence or through a seamless sequence of almost puzzle-like situations where every situation tries to be like this memorable set piece that, that iterates on the mechanics. Again, like regardless of what you think of a game like Half-Life 2, I think Half-Life 2 kind of tries to fit that exact same mold, or it's also setting that paradigm along with a game like Resident Evil 4. And then the next big game that would adopt that is Gears of War. And th that was that was the shit in the seventh gen of consoles. That was that was the default video game, arguably. And uh and that's kind of the template that Mikami stuck with for the rest of his run. If you sort of look at uh, The Evil Within, obviously, and Vanquish. I think God Hand also, obviously it's a very arcadey, very, very old school feeling game. Um, and that was after RE4 also, which is significant. But I, th I think God Hand is a great example of this effort of, okay, Obviously it's a very mechanically driven game where it's trying to challenge you, you're going through a situation, but then every element on screen is, it, it feels considered, it feels like part of a greater whole. In, in God Hand, again, that's expressed. And for example, you have, there's like great consideration for, okay, we're gonna put a barrel here that you can throw at guys. We're gonna put a ledge here that you can kick people off. It feels, it feels like every part of the game is like very carefully designed, very deliberate. It's it's very aware of organically guiding your attention in a certain way. I think that is very much Mikami style. I think another trend 
you see across his games is some form of resource management or at least some form of mm, there there's a slightly dynamic element of okay the player can influence what they go into the next fight with or the into the next situation with again even as early as aladdin you have the apples that you can throw and the apples are something that you collect in the environment and i would say i mean that game is like insanely generous with the apples i wouldn't say that's a super meaningful development of that game but you see it in pretty much every single one of those games. In Resident Evil, it's super obvious, but even Piano 3, where you, you have side missions that, like you, I forget if you can actually grind in that game, but the armor upgrades in it are pretty important. Uh, God Hands obviously plays with that. It even plays with sort of random loot drops that have a pretty big outcome, uh, pretty big impact on the outcome of battles. The impression I have of Mikami is almost that of a methodical craftsman. He strikes me as someone who is very confident and very decisive in how he directs games. And that's the exact opposite impression that I get from Kamiya. <laughs> Kamiya seems like obviously he has a certain persona that he puts out on Twitter, but every story you read about him he he comes across as much more meek, much more easily swayed. He has this very obvious, wide-eyed, almost naive passion and excitement about games. Like literally old-ass arcade games that he played as a kid, that's all he fucking talks about. <laughs> and um, obviously Mikami played games before he joined Capcom and he still plays games. But I, I get the sense from him that when he was at Capcom, that's really where he developed this very theoretical, uh, almost artisanal understanding of the medium, obviously through his work with Tsukuro Fujiwara, who is the goat behind Ghosts and Goblins and Bayona Commando and all those games. One of the Capcom OGs. And I think that impression... If you, if you look at this history, that is really reflected in their gameography as well. Because you look at Kamiya stuff, and you see him try to find his voice a little bit in his first two games, in his first two uh, directorial efforts with DMC and Resident Evil 2. So he's kind of getting closer and closer to what he really wants to do. And then with Beautiful Joe, he finds a style and he walks in. He He's stuck with that basically up until now. And specifically what I'm talking about is this paradigm of the the set versus where, okay, we, we recognize the fighting system, these open-ended combo heavy fighting mechanics. This is the bread and butter of the game. So we'll, we have stages that you go through, but then the meat and potatoes of the game is these these literally locked in arena fights that come at certain intervals where you can leave and where you're graded as well. And obviously the, the grading, I think the grading system actually, as much as people maybe sometimes um, want to dismiss it, disregard it for not being that well thought out, blah, blah, whatever, I don't care. It is an important piece of the puzzle because Obviously, and Kamiya has said this explicitly, he wanted to emulate the feeling that he had when playing in an arcade. And I think that is the key to understanding his directorial style in general. He, he wants to emulate the excitement that he feels with games. I don't think he has this super um, kind of deep philosophical motive behind it. I think it is, again, it is very much carried by passion and excitement. Now, I guess with Beautiful Joe, I'm curious, again, exactly who came up with the, with the grading system or, again, with the paradigm of having the fights so separated from everything else. Because I do think that is a significant difference from, from Mikami's style, where Bayonetta doesn't really have, like, it's pretty rare to have 
level elements that are that are that sort of fulfill um like universal functions that you can play with in fights like like the barrels and god hand um or some of the shit that you've seen already for there's like a little bit of that like i think generally the level design in bayonetta is very strong and it does play into the fights but um, I'm specifically thinking stuff like like the start of Route 666 where you're on the cars and like that's pretty cool, or uh, or the the broken sky where you're you're going up the plane and the wind is kind of pushing you down, or the you have the little globes that you're the Mario Galaxy style kind of planetoids that you're fighting on. All that shit is really cool, but it's it's very different from the Resident Evil 4 God Hand Vanquish puzzly kind of approach to fights. I'm not sure how exactly to articulate the difference, but um, I think in, in Kamiya's games it is just very common. Okay, you're in a small arena and then they just let the AI do its thing. There's a lot of consideration in making the AI very compelling to fight against. To the point where you could put it like in a blank room and then the game is still fun. Whereas in Resident Evil 4, that's not really the case. The game is very much built on the idea that, okay, every, the designer needs to really, or the designers, I should say, they really need to go in and like hand pick every single part of the level. As far as, um oh yeah, so, uh, so the original question, right? There's a, uh, how pocket you mentioned influence which is interesting because you could take that both okay what are their influences versus how much influence have their games had um i've covered a little bit of you know sort of their uh, where their influences come from as far as like how their games sort of are received in the wider landscape i yeah, I, I still do believe, okay, Resident Evil 4 was part of a wave of, cinem I want to say cinematic games. Um, and it's not, that's not to say that necessarily, oh, Resident Evil 4 is like bereft of gameplay or whatever. Like, it's, why am I landing on this word cinematic? I guess like the idea of like a journey, you know, the idea of, okay... Um, the player is put through this very choreographed journey, uh, which I'm not even sure if like most designers now trace it back to RE4, but I do think RE4 was one of the first games that like really put a lot of um, emphasis on that. Um, I want to say with Kamiya, his influence is much more, um, much more niche. Um, if there, I, I do think Witch Time is like the one thing that a lot of thing, a lot of, a lot of games, a lot of developers kind of latched onto. That was a, a thing that was weirdly copied across a bunch of places. Even maybe not in a very literal way where I would wish the exact same, but I feel like I can think of a bunch of games that were like, okay, like slow-mo as a reward of some kind is like sort of cool. I, I think Bayonetta is one of those games that a lot of game developers in the West, like even at bigger mainstream studios, they do like it, but they also like it in kind of a surface level. <laughs> um, I'm specifically thinking like uh, the new God of War games, for example, right? That include optional equipment that, that, basically, that basically like use wish time. Um, but then they don't really look at the, the deeper stuff that's going on there. I'm just like, fine, whatever. Um, whereas I think, honestly, with Mikami's style, the way all that works, I think there's more general things to pilfer from. I think it's, it's much easier to look at those games and be like, okay, this is... I think they're much more about the fundamentals of game design, right? They're much more about, okay, this is how we guide the player's attention. This is how we make different elements sort of gel together with each other. I think Kamiya is, I mean, and I love his games, right? This is not even, this is not like a statement on their quality at all, but um, 
he is so within his own niche. And, and again, that's not even to say that the games are like these like crazy uh, fucking experimental, hard to understand games. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I do think, um, again, they're every 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 element of their design is like so specific to that type of experience that it's pretty hard to take away one element and apply to other things. Um, I do think Bayonetta specifically is like such a great example of of um, really every part of the experience feeling maxed out <laughs> where it's a game that that lets the player express their intent to a ridiculous degree there's very few games that are so open and so forthcoming with just what you can do with the kid but then simultaneously they did not skimp on the the challenge factor like it is a game that very much um that is very willing to match what, what the player puts out. So I think overall, just going off of that, I do, oh man, I, I mean, I like both of their uh, libraries a lot. So I, I, I have a hard time saying, okay, I, I would personally as a designer pill for more from there or from here. Um, I do think, yeah, I guess I want to say Mikami style again, it's more universal and it's, it's much easier to emulate a lot of those principles. I'm thinking, okay, if I make a game on a smaller scale with, with my abilities, I would probably look more at Resident Evil 4 than I would look at Bayonetta. I think in, Bay in a game like Bayonetta, again, I applied with Beautiful Joe, you don't really know who exactly set down those exact paradigms. I don't know if Kami, again, was the one that came up with the grading system. Um, you need so much residual talent and so much knowledge, I think, to to make a game like, like Bayonetta. There are so many different things need to come together. Whereas I think in RE4's case, if you just have one guy at the top who, who kind of micromanages, um, you can make that game. Uh, yeah, that's all I have on that.